Welcome, everyone, to uh, this SSP webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to have you with us, and we're very pleased to have uh, a terrific all-star panel uh, that is going to explore with us this very provocative and interesting question of uh, are we all getting out of the print business? If so, how? If not, why? Uh, my co-organizer for this event is Allison Maurer, who is the Scholarly Communications and Copyright Librarian at the University of Utah, Marriott Library. And uh, just as a reminder, my name is Bill Silbert. Uh, Allison and I have both been involved with SSP uh, activities for quite a long time. My latest uh, position is as a consultant in the communications and publishing issues for not-for-profits mostly. And I've also recently uh, taken on a part-time position as uh, editor-at-large for the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. So the issues we're going to be talking about are extremely relevant, and those of you who, like uh, most of us, have been attending SSP and other professional meetings for a number of years uh, will be very familiar with this topic. We've talked about it really for a long, long time, and uh, it's interesting to me particularly that many of the questions we ask and some of the answers we get and much of the debate we continue to have uh, has not changed uh, all that radically in some cases since we first uh, began talking about this. But in many ways, we, uh, we have seen uh, a number of uh, print-only or print, uh, excuse me, online-only or online mostly models uh, into the marketplace that uh, were not there a few years ago. So we think it's a very timely uh, point here to have a discussion with our, uh, with our experts. Let me uh, uh, introduce Allison at this point to uh, tell us who is uh, online who will be uh, discussing this topic with us today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As Bill said, my name is Allison Maurer. I'm the Scholar Communications and Copyright Librarian at the University of Utah. We have three great and wonderful speakers with us today who have very graciously agreed to speak on this topic. Uh, we have Jane Marks, who is the Vice President and Editorial Director of Durham at Sage Publications. We have William Cook, who is the Director of Publications at American Geophysical Union. And we have Robert Schwarzfelder, who is Associate University Librarian for Engineering and Science at Stanford University Libraries. Uh, and they'll each um, speak for a few, a few minutes, and then we'll also have a time for questions and answer session at the end of the webinar. Um, and Bill is very interested in kind of hearing a little bit from from the library perspective and the library side of things, so I, I thought maybe I'd just kind of give a quick overview of some of the, the relevant um, things going on within the library world, and, and, and just a, a, a quick note to say that one of the, the leading articles um, that was written recently um, in 2007 by David Lewis, he, he, was, he was the dean of libraries at IUPUI. He, he wrote very convincing convincingly about libraries, the importance of libraries adopting new strategic directions, and his, his strategy has five components to it. And the first of his kind of strategy, this is really very important for us in terms of, you know, how much electronic information there is available for us to purchase. So this is, for publishers, this is as much uh, relevant to librarians and, and libraries as well. So with that, I think we're probably ready to start. Thanks, Allison. And, uh, the panel we've assembled, uh, what we hope to do is to have folks give you uh, the, the, the multiple points of view and raise the many issues that are uh, really at top of mind when we talk about uh, moving uh, more dramatically and fully to an electronic, uh, an electronic marketplace. So we're going to start with uh, Jay Marks, who is Vice President and Editorial Director for Journals at Sage Publications. Uh, being a large publisher who is dealing with multiple audiences, uh, institutional, uh, uh, institutional audiences, uh, societies, uh, as well as uh, the, the business issues related to being a large publisher, we thought Jane would uh, be an excellent, uh, an excellent person to start with and give us uh, kind of a broad, uh, a broad overview. And I must apologize because I'm at the end of Jane's slides, so I am going to back them up. Bear with us here for a second. There we go. And I'm going to uh, hand off duties to Jane. Okay. Thank you, Bill. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me to come along and talk to you all the, uh, this afternoon about this. It's uh, 
It's a fascinating topic, and it's one that we spend a lot of time here at SAGE talking about. And I'm going to cover a little bit of our experience both um, working on journals and looking at reference publishing as well. Um, I'm going to talk um, about uh, how far we move forward. There we go. Uh, so, succeeded with the technology. That's a good start. So, um, I was going to talk a, bit, a little bit about how we're progressing so far in moving to electronic, and we have started to experiment with uh, e-only, and I've got some some, uh, some updates for everybody on, on how we've done and what's working, and probably more, more interesting for most of, most of you is what has not worked. So, looking at uh, journals first, we have uh, around 620 journals. They're all available online, uh, but we have less than 30 of those that are only available online. And uh, there are major advantages, I think everybody knows, to having online uh, journals in particular. Um, the speed and the cost of distribution, particularly for global distribution, the ability to be able to publish simultaneously in um, in in California, um, in London, and Japan at the press of a button is um, enormously important. And I think uh, most of us have seen a much better take-up of our publications in uh, far flung parts of the world now that we can distribute everything in a timely fashion online. There are obviously additional features that you can add to online publications that you can't do in print, supplemental data, um, which is um, particularly important in certain disciplines. And I think both for librarians and for publishers, being able to monitor, mo monitor exactly um, how well used our publications are um, is increasingly important, particularly in this uh, time when library budgets are so tight. Um, everybody wants to know who's using what. And then I think most in the amount of traffic that's coming from uh, mobile devices, whether that's smartphones or uh, tablet devices, we're definitely seeing, uh, admittedly a small but growing fairly rapidly, um, in, uh, incoming usage from mobile devices. So just turning to our business model, um, I think the in the journal market, I think it's generally, um, there are fairly similar business models. This one is stages. So the institutional base price is print plus, plus online. We give a discount if somebody wants to have print only. And we give um, a bigger discount if somebody wants to take online only. We debate this particular um, model and whether or not we should offer print only. Um, frequently, but um, this is one, one issue here that I've mentioned is the sales tax or VAT issue in Europe is a real consideration for any publication that has um, a, a good penetration into the European market. Um, you have to be careful to be able to justify uh, your print and online um, uh, pricing model to the, uh, the sales tax authorities in those regions. So there are, we have some constraints in terms of saying, well, let's turn everything over to online only because the prices will go up in European markets. We, are, we do the same as many other publishers. We offer a package of our online journals to consortia um, with a very deep discount then for any libraries within those, uh, that buy those packages who want to take uh, print in addition to their package. So this is our, our model. Uh, it's designed, as you can see, to try and encourage people if they want us to move more rapidly to online only. So um, as I mentioned on the next slide, we tried this. We took uh, 12 of our social science journals in 2009, and we moved them to online only. And uh, it really was not a success. Um, we deliberately chose social science journals because um, science journals, I think, are more open to this, but we wanted to really test um, potentially, I guess, the most resistant market to see what um, social science uh, librarians would think of this. 
The first feedback we got was from the editors and authors. There was a certain amount of pushback that this was, um, they felt, um, in some way downgrading their journal. And uh, we were expecting to get uh, probably the same attrition rate in terms of uh, subscription cancellations as we did for the rest of our social science titles. And we hoped we would get um, a, a lower cancellation rate because the prices would be better. In fact, we saw a more than 5% increase in our attrition rate. So we actually saw more libraries cancelling because we'd moved to online only. Um, we got a wide variety of different feedback about this. Um, to some extent, this may be because we drew attention to these titles. Um, and to some extent, I think it was, there is a certain number of uh, potentially small liberal arts colleges, perhaps, who prefer to have their publications still in print. So this is completely counterintuitive to what we were expecting to find within uh, the market today. Having said that, we're not going to, uh, to give up. We're certainly still looking at options to provide online only in medical and basic science disciplines. And then one option that we find is uh, perhaps more uh, popular is that we offer print on demand um, at a premium price. And so the basic, uh, the basic subscription is online only, but if a, uh, um, a librarian or, or um, institution wants to take uh, the print, then there is a print option. But the key here then is thinking about how do we handle uh, members and members of uh, society partners that for whom we publish. And again, this varies uh, enormously from discipline to discipline. In many senses, societies uh, are defined for their members by the print subscriptions that come through the door. And if they're not able to deliver those print subscriptions, uh, then in some senses it feels as though there is not the same member benefit. Um, in many, for many of our societies, we recommend that they offer it as an option so that the, uh, the individual member can opt to take online only if they wish to do so. And we see roughly 15 to 20% take up, and that's growing steadily in most uh, of the societies on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, the one other area that I should have mentioned actually in this is um, also the issue of um, uh, print and print advertising. There is no doubt that print advertising is not moving to online advertising at the same rate. And so for a number of our medical publications, we would continue to encourage our society partners to, to stick with print uh, for their members because that really um, helps to support the, the print advertising. So what uh, I was I think the first one that we, we certainly learned loud and clear is that the social sciences in particular are really not ready for online only in any kind of wholesale way at all. Um, that means that we have to accept that we have to bear the cost of dual options, dual publishing and print and online for some time to come. It may well be worth looking at more print on demand options. Um, it doesn't necessarily work as well in, in all disciplines. Sometimes it's better to have uh, high quality printing and, and the large printing print run um, straight out of the gate. And the other thing that we found is taking print away from members is something that the societies find um, is more difficult uh, to help in their ability to retain their members. So then just turning to uh, reference publishing, some of the, uh, this is another area where it's very much a library purchase, and so we have moved all our encyclopedias and handbooks are now available online. Um, and we're finding that increasingly online, uh, sorry, income that from our reference publishing is now 50% uh, coming from electronic and 50% from print. I suspect that within probably a couple of years, the online will have overtaken print. Um, our pricing model is that online is 120% of print, and this is because uh, we do find that in, um, particularly for some of our um, uh, more popular 
uh, reference books that the library may have purchased more than one copy or more than one library within a campus may have purchased a copy. So again, we decided that we would trial some online only. So we had a, a series of six reference works that we published last year. Um, they were all on green topics, online only. Um, the content was, uh, was well received by the market, but sales were extremely poor, much, much lower than our print and online equivalent of, um, in other areas. And we did a detailed analysis of what it was that was impacting sales on these books. And what we were finding was that they were not showing up in book distributors' catalogs, and so the librarians were just not available, that they had, were just not um, aware that they were now available, and they were not able to easily purchase them. The other thing we discovered is that they were not being reviewed um, uh, because uh, for, for, by many of the library journals because um, they were not as visible, and reviewers frequently like to have, or generally like to have, a print copy in front of them. So we decided that we would actually publish them in print in 2011. So when the remainder of the series publishes this year, we will actually be printing the entire series in print um, so that we hope to be able to retain some of those uh, sales. So lessons uh, from this, I think we've, uh, we've discovered is that um, certainly for reference, the academic book distribution channel is really not ready for online only. There are many links in the chain that just don't seem to work as well for online only. And clearly reviewers do still like to see the book. So we feel that uh, for reference publishing, that dual publishing is definitely here to stay for a few more years at least. And I think that is the end of my presentation. So um, I'm now going to pass over to Bill um, to talk to you if I can work out how to make this work. Um, I'm Bill Cook from the American Geophysical Union. Uh, I'm, my comments aren't going to be significantly different uh, from Jane's in the sense that um, her last point is spot on. I think the uh, likelihood of continuing to have to provide um, print and electronic for the next several years is going to stay with us. Um, just a couple of items about um, you know, the publishing environment in general. Uh, virtually all science journals are now available electronically. Many of them are still available in print. Um, in most cases, the electronic version is the version of record um, in a large part because there are components uh, that are available electronically that can't be made available in print, quick time movies, uh, rotating molecules, that kind of stuff. Um, only about 10% of journals are publicly available without access control, in other words, open access. But that's only about 2 to 5% two to of the articles. And when you're talking about open access, you know, there's no such thing as open access for print. So there, there's another uh, twist to this whole uh, idea. These are our uh, data. Um, our print subscriptions are declining significantly. Uh, this is through 2009, 2010, uh, continued that trend. 2011, actually, the, the decline in print subscriptions got even steeper. Um, at the same time, our electronic uh, with, with a print add-on is also in decline, but our electronic only is way up, and the revenue is up with it. So that says to us that, that the market may need no print. Um, a little bit of background on AGU. We began print in 1896. We began publishing online in 2002. In 2008, we actually made an announcement that we would no longer offer print versions of the journals uh, after 2011, and that was because there had been this steep decline in print for the last several years. But we took a look at what our actual subscriptions were in 2009 and said, you know what, there's enough people out there that still want it. 
that we're not going to uh, discontinue subscriptions. So we made the announcement that we're going to continue those. Well, then what do we do? How do we manage that process? You know, the big problem with the decline in revenue is that you have the continuing uh, cost of providing the print. So how do you manage a uh, market, a, a product, where your costs are either increasing or at best remain uh, the same and your revenues are in decline. Well, we're probably not going to add additional revenue, so we've got to start uh, continue, uh, figuring out ways to make the print a little cheaper. And then why would we continue to print? There's lots of places in the world where the infrastructure doesn't really support uh, 24 by 7 access to the web. Either their uh, web servers aren't reliable or, in fact, their basic infrastructure, electricity, isn't reliable. There are places in the world where access is throttled by the government. Think about China and other places where um, you, know, you hear about scientists not being able to get online all the time because uh, they don't have uh, access, the government is controlling the access libraries, which is they want the print for the archive. They don't, it's not necessarily a question of trust, but they wonder about how long um, the electronic versions are going to be available from either the publisher or a group like Portico, who uh, many publishers are using for their archive repository. So they still want to keep their own print repository. They view it as a mission. And then Jane brought up yet another point. Uh, in especially Western Europe, you have bad issues that uh, add a significant cost component uh, to the electronic versions you don't see in print. And, in other words, the market demands that we continue to offer print. And that's, that's driving the NGU uh, view of the print world today. Look a little bit at where research is coming from. Um, you can see, of course, that it's huge in the U.S., huge in Western Europe, but it's growing in China, it's growing in India, and in those places, as I just mentioned, you've got issues with uh, the researchers uh, uh, getting access to uh, the materials 100% of the time. So we feel that we need to continue in print, but then how do we keep the cost down? Well, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we see declining subscriptions, less revenue, fewer copies, not going to get a big price increase, so we've got to reduce costs. But the key to us is we need to stay in the game. We need to continue to offer print. So we've got to do something to reduce pages, use modern print technology, um, reduce the number of copies uh, that we sell, or somehow outsource it. In other words, shift the risk to uh, – uh, first, in reducing the pages, here's two copies of our journals. Um, these are both now – and I'll open them up for you in just a minute uh, – using uh, a methodology that's called uh, condense and rotate. In other words, you put the same amount of content on one page that was previously on two pages. And if you look at this version, uh, which opens up kind of like a gatefold, you can see there's four columns of uh, uh, print uh, where you would normally expect to see two. It's still bound on the long edge. And this is the version that we send to our libraries, what we call an archive copy. You can also, uh, this is a, a different journal but the same concept, um, differentiate, though, between what we're sending to libraries and what we're sending to uh, individuals. And this is the same page oriented uh, slightly differently and bound slightly differently to give you more of a reading copy that somebody would read naturally, you know, turning the pages left to right instead of top to bottom. Um, there was an unintended consequence of uh, moving to this differentiation, and that is that there is some uh, instances where we're turning up member copies in institutions, and this is a really easy way to identify. It's almost impossible 
to put this version on a library shelf and have it stand up so it's got to be uh, laid on its side and it becomes immediately obvious that it's there. Using modern print technology, we use Cadmus for our uh, uh, printer, um, and all of our journals are now on digital presses, which are much less expensive. Because, well, if you use the Convince to Rotate, then you've immediately cut your uh, number of pages in half, and as the uh, print quantities are declining, it, it makes it um, economically reasonable to go on to digital presses. Also, we need to cut the copies. Um, some of that's happening uh, in, in the sense that subscriptions are in decline, so the copies are in decline. We still need to fulfill all the, all the subscriptions, but our next greatest cost uh, is from claims. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, the library is saying they didn't get it. Well, we found that the biggest area for claims was coming from overseas, and that the biggest area uh, was coming from dropship to agents. So the solution we arrived at was to actually send every copy either over to an end user who we know is overseas to uh, that user with a return receipt so that we know for a fact that the, uh, uh, the copy has been received by the end user or by somebody who is representing that end user. It essentially cuts the claims to zero and you can reduce the uh, uh, number of copies that you have to produce uh, because you're not covering claims anymore. You get an advantage from the uh, uh, condensed and rotate as well in your shipping costs because by cutting the number of pages in half, of course, you cut the number or you cut the weight of the uh, copy in half. Um, outsourcing is another option for us. In other words, why do we have to manage the print? Why does the publisher have to manage the print? Uh, we went with an agent in Asia to take our PDFs um, and print them uh, locally and distribute them locally. There's a couple of different ways you can manage that. You can just send, send them the uh, PDFs and say, okay, you guys go out and sell it. Um, pay us a royalty uh, whenever, uh, you know, for however much the sales you can generate. Um, or uh, the publisher can manage it, send those PDFs with a mailing list, and pay the agent a commission. We've chosen to uh, send those to um, send the PDFs and let the uh, uh, agent manage it for us and, and then pay the agent the royalty. Uh, and of course we're sending the formatted PDF files. You have to ask in this, what's the end game? You know, how long can we be in this kind of combined arena? Because subscriptions are very likely to continue to decline. It's probably a fairly long, thin tail, but it's going to be there. Um, eventually, prices are probably going to have to start to come up again um, because the number of subscriptions are going to be so low as to not uh, or get to the point where they're not covering the costs again. Um, but if you can get a fair price for a single copy, why wouldn't you or somebody acting as your agent produce it? Um, the last customer is going to have to make a choice. You know, the last person buying the last copy of your journal is probably going to have to pay a pretty fair chunk for it. If you've taken some of the steps that we've talked about to keep the cost down, it may not be a tremendous price, but it's not going to be distributed out over several copies, so it's going to be fairly expensive. But the answer in our, wor in our world is let the market decide. And that concludes my presentation. And I think now I'm turning it over to Alice. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I think we're going to move into Bob's presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A session after, after Bob's, um, after his slides. So let me do a quick introduction of Bob. He, Bob Schwarzwalder, he is the Associate University Librarian for engineering at STEM science at Stanford University Library, which is probably 
most famously known at this point to be a primarily e-only library. So, Bob, I will make you the presenter now and let you take it away. Thank you, Allison. I'm just waiting for that transition. Okay, here it comes. Great. Oops. Okay, and again, we're at the end of my slide, so I apologize. Before I start, let me read a brief excerpt from the final report of the TULIP project. TULIP was the Elsevier project and to develop online journals in the field of material science. And this was written in uh, 1996. Uh, and they say, not everyone is ready for digital collections, nor will they be soon. The number of academic libraries really ready to support digital collections is still small. Now, this is 15 years ago. So as we look at these changes and we look at some of the decisions being made about abandoning paper copying, we have to realize that we've made this transition between not really knowing if there was a market for digital. I think this has been a fast-moving target, and it's not done yet. We're in the middle of the transition. We really have to stay flexible and responsive to the marketplace. My position is not only associate university librarian for science and engineering libraries, but also I'm director of the digital library development at Stanford. And so I'm in a unique position both to be a customer for digital and generating some of the technology that will bring us there. Part of this is really understanding why are we making this transition, what's behind it, and I'll try to explore that and what I feel to be some of the things pushing this forward and some of the things holding it back. First of all, really, this is a response to the user. There has been a strong demand for digital information. And we see this particularly in the area of journals and particularly in science, engineering, technology, medicine, mathematics, really those sci-tech fields uh, that have uh, adopted this so quickly. Um, the, there are some reasons behind this, and a lot of them, in my observation of usage, is really the access to the materials. Uh, I'll point to this at a couple times in the presentation. People don't necessarily like reading digital information. They prefer to make a paper copy. It's the fact that they can get a hold of it very rapidly. There's another driver here, however, and that really is the critical storage issues involved in paper publication. For Stanford, we get a linear mile and a half of paper publications a year. Uh, these have to be put someplace. Uh, real estate is very expensive in Palo Alto. Uh, buildings are very expensive to construct. There's a recent report out uh, by the Library Resources Group called Redesigning the Percent of Libraries said over the last, over the past three years, they've used the same amount of collection space, and about 39% have decreased the amount of collection space. And this is in the face of ever-growing paper collections. Where do they go? So if you look at this move to digital, a lot of this really started in the early and mid-1990s, and there were two seminal projects. Tulip and Red Sage that experimented with the development of the digital journals. There were forays into this area before then, but at this point, serious publisher attention came to is there a market, a technology, an approach for producing and marketing electronic journals? And it was a fairly intrepid adventure in the beginning, but what we saw in the 1990s and beyond was a really rapid uptake in the implementation of electronic journals. This started uh, a little bit generationally, and that graduate students glommed on to it before some of the faculty. Uh, but in recent surveys that I've taken two years ago and a couple of months ago, you know, what I'm finding is for the scientific disciplines, really over 90% department by department will almost entirely or almost entirely use the electronic. There's almost no one, at Stanford at least, in the scientific disciplines, 
who's using the paper exclusively or primarily. This is really a watershed event, I think. Now, as time has gone on, we've replaced an irrational fear of electronic with an irrational exuberance uh, over preservation issues. So if you look at where a lot of people were 10 years ago, where a lot of people are, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, where there might be six, seven copies across the university. In the case of something like science or nature, double that or triple it or quadruple it. So libraries have kind of moved their focus to saying, let us have an archival copy, but we'll really rely upon the electronic. Now, Stanford and some others, in light of budgetary concerns, have really moved to kind of an e-only policy here. So at least for the scientific disciplines, we have abandoned paper entirely wherever we can. Uh, this doesn't mean that we've abandoned paper. There are some journals that is, are produced only in paper. Uh, there are some where basically we receive a paper copy for a variety of reasons. But where we can, uh, for the journals, we've gone to electronic only. Now, if you look at e-books, I think they're following a similar path that the journals have taken. Uh, there are some unique issues with e-books, and I'll touch on these later, that make them a bit more problematic. Uh, digital collections at Stanford, certainly they are strongest in the STEM disciplines, uh, that's true. Uh, but what you're seeing is really across the disciplines, there is a very strong preference for electronic journals. And this is even in the social sciences and humanities. Uh, that is not to say people are willing to give up paper entirely in those disciplines, uh, but what you're finding is very, very strong use and differentiation in terms of journals as opposed to books. In the humanities, the social sciences, and in some degree in the STEM disciplines, uh, you still see a real strong preference for paper books. We are moving into other areas in terms of digital information, uh, maps, by electronically, uh, audio and video as well. Uh, there are some issues here that I will cover in a minute. If we look at the user impacts here, you know, I, I think what you will find is if you have two versions of information, one in paper and one electronically, the digital information is experienced far more usage than the paper. And we've borne this out over and over again, and that's really across disciplines. If you do focus groups with graduate students, postdocs especially, but even with faculty members who perhaps are somewhat more traditional in their use, uh, what you'll find is that people will use the digital copy, and if they can't find a digital copy, they will just simply substitute uh, for something that's available on paper only. Graduate students and postdocs, if they can't find something digital in a collection, will actually go to college and other universities and try to get a bootleg copy. Not that they do this at Stanford, mind you, but uh, certainly at other places. But the approach really uh, is to say that it's far more convenient to get the digital, and so people will use the paper copy as a fallback or last resort, often ignoring it if it's not in digital. If you look at where some of the leading edge users are, they really are trying to integrate uh, electronic publications, and they're doing this in terms of course reserves and course management system, they're using it as components of teaching. Uh, and I'm using course management software here very broadly to mean not just Blackboard and Sakai, but a variety of applications, at least at Stanford, that our own faculty are developing uh, to assist them with their teaching. So there is really a strong interest. On the negative side, uh, there have been some side effects of moving to digital. Um, one of them is that publishers and jobbers have been using interface as a market tool, trying to drive users to their collections, to their publications, to their groups of databases or other materials uh, by setting up a, a somewhat proprietary interface with different roles, 
uh, different search methodologies, uh, different look and appearance, different password uh, from other information. For users, this is an impediment to usage. Uh, people really dislike the idea that they have to learn another system, another interface, in some cases get another password where we can't use IP authentication uh, to search a different system. What they really want is to be able to browse between collections so they can find anything on the subject regardless of publisher. Now, we've worked with publishers for many years and understand that there is a, an ownership of information and a pride and a branding of that where the publishers feel this is really key to their identities. Uh, however, this loyalty, brand loyalty for users really is diminishing. You don't see the same sort of identity in terms of a publisher or society that you did 10, 15 years ago. People really want to search across these silos of information and are regarding this proliferation of interfaces as an obstacle. The other thing is a real lack of visibility. This is particularly true in the case of e-books. And one of the issues, I think, in terms of the green reference books perhaps not doing so well, is that they just aren't visible. Now, for electronic books that we can load in catalogs is minimal and poor. Uh, often that metadata is provided after the fact for the material. So it really it does not become visible for users. Uh, this is true in a lot of the typical venues that we use to find electronic books. Most of the sales of electronic books, at least in my experience, are done in packages. So there's less item by item selection, less visibility for the item. And, you know, basically you're losing a lot of the pathways that people have used to find, to buy, and to discover uh, electronic books. So this is a real problem. Uh, this will impact sales for you. The other thing with e-books in terms of a negative aspect is that the e-readers still are not the norm. Uh, there has certainly been a big proliferation of the Kindle and some of the other devices, uh, but there are impediments here. Uh, I'll get to this in a minute. Some of this, well, I'll get to it now. Uh, some of the limits on use and reuse really inhibit usage and utility of the item. And let's take ebooks as an example here. Uh, I can subscribe to everything from a publisher, and I can have that content available from my website. If I want to download that content into a Kindle and make that a Kindle available for our students, I can't do it. I really have to go back and repurchase the same content and download it into the Kindle or some other reader. The fact that the content isn't portable between devices means that you really are putting a blockade for people who want to use it. You have these somewhat popular devices like a Kindle and the two don't, don't mix. Uh, the idea of using a web interface is often not as attractive to people as using a specific reader. Some of the challenges here. Uh, I could talk a very long time of contractual issues, and I think the limits on use are a key contractual obstacle. Uh, I would like to pay a fair price for content, but I would I like to be able to use that seamlessly. I'd like to be able to integrate that into devices. I'd like to be able to integrate that into course management systems. I would like for my clientele to make those materials as available as a paper copy in the library. The other thing is we really have to develop some standard terms and conditions about security. Uh, I have seen contracts that I've been forced basically to walk away from that says that any breach in security and illegal use of the information by third parties will result in horrendous uh, liability on Stanford's part. Uh, this is unrealistic. Uh, we take great pride in the fact that we have taken strong measures uh, to prevent misuse, illegal use, and used by outside parties of materials that we've licensed. Uh, but I would be lying if I said that it was completely impenetrable or bulletproof. 
Uh, no one has. If, if Citigroup and Chase Manhattan can be hacked into, then certainly so can Stanford. Um, what I would like to see is those contracts set a standard to say certain measures need to be in place to protect the security of that information, but not set unreachable goals in terms of having an, an absolutely secure environment. No one has an absolute security. There is a problem that we really do not have a proven preservation method for digital material. Besides Portico, certainly I will point to locks and clocks as another, and, and I feel very strong, approach to digital preservation. So I think the community, Stanford included, is trying to come up with methodologies that we feel will ensure the availability of digital materials. But, you know, we're pretty early on in the history of this thing. So can any of us say that, that these are absolutely foolproof? Certainly we can't. The other thing I would point to as a real challenge is a lack of any kind of clear business model for material that's out of print but still in copyright. Uh, the recent decision by Judge Chin and the Google consent decree, uh, I, I think, was, was really problematic. My hope is that we can come up with some arrangements uh, with publishers, with authors, with Google, with the community at large that will set some fair compensation so that I can get digital information where there's no marketplace for it anymore. If we basically we're saying that there's no way I can provide a copy of a book that is not been produced in digital form when we're trying to run an increasingly digital library, then, you know, I, I basically have no way to proceed. Uh, I'm hoping that there is some way that we can create fair compensation here that's agreeable to every all parties. So as libraries, where are we going and why are we there? Um, I have to say that in the current environment, cost concerns are a price. The big deal approach, which was very successful a decade earlier, is becoming significantly less popular. And it's less popular because the big deal locks in a market share over a number of years with usually a fixed rate of inflation. In situations where someone's collection budget can drop 20% or more in a given year, and we can't predict that future, how can we lock in a majority of our budget to deal with, say, give us very little flexibility? Um, this puts us in an absolutely untenable position, and so there's getting to be more and more resistance to signing this kind of arrangement. New publications obviously are facing a very tough marketplace, and, and I think anything you bring to market as a new publication, you really have to demonstrate the value, and you really have to do your market research very, very well, uh, because people typically are locked in to serial subscriptions, in particular monographic series, other publications where they know there's an audience and they feel safe with that. Uh, this focus on material that we know is used, that we know is core, you know, to the research and the teaching that we do uh, is a huge driver, and it's really hard to change that game. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that the libraries which have caved rapidly in terms of, of cost inflation uh, have demonstrated remarkable resistance when onerous uh, digital rights management models come up. Now, this has happened a couple of times in the last five years very prominently, uh, where people either restrict the total amount of use of a digital object or they require information on who's using it, and basically the market has just shut them down. Uh, people will not buy. Uh, if the rules of the game are changed so significantly for electronic publications uh, that they really don't have the right to distribute that. And, and I would say that this is one thing where the library committee has shown a remarkable backbone. They simply won't go there. Um, usage really is the metric, uh, and 
anything, as I mentioned, that limits use of e-books or, or puts marketing of interface above availability of information, I, I think you really have to re-examine that uh, because you're, you're cutting into usage and you're making yourself a target. And the other, the last thing I'll say here is that for some of these other areas of publication in terms of digital, there are really severe software limitations that will limit those marketplaces. In the case of streaming media, uh, the software that allows it uh, is a very immature market. And so you have products like Culture and ShareStream, but those products are glitchy. They, they, don't, they don't really have all the components that people would want. And because of that, because the utility of the digital information is still very limited, the marketplace will be limited. And in the case of data, for instance, the recent version of Esri, I think 9.3 software, is really very bad. And, and you can't work with medium or large size GIS files. Uh, and as long as we have that kind of glitchy software, it's really going to limit the utility of those and thus the marketplace. So where are we going here? Uh, I think for publishers and other people developing information, you really have to develop a compelling use case. And I think where you can add advantage to the information, most of your comic book simply like a paper item that's represented on a computer. Uh, as long as we do that, then you're basically just recreating the paper environment. You're limiting the utility of that item. If you put together the information in a useful way, if you add functionality to the information, then I think you expand your marketplace. Uh, what Elsevier has done with Scopus, I think, is an interesting case in point. Uh, novel, I think, use of handbook materials of making them more searchable and using them, even though their marketing has not been up to par, I think is another case where people have taken traditional information and made it more valuable in terms of how they're wrapping it, how they're providing it. That really is the, the, that really is the area, I think, where publishers can make major breakthroughs and expand their marketplaces. Uh, diminishing the barriers for use is critical. As long as I can't find an ebook, I can't search it, and I can't use it, then why do you expect me to buy it? Uh, if you inherently go out and develop a product that is so limited in utility, then you're never going to replace the paper with it. Uh, you're hamstringing that product from the get-go. Um, the other thing is we really have to uh, allow blended information environments. And at Stanford, for instance, we really publish for our graduate students their dissertations and theses. This is an in-house process. And we eventually make that available through Google to anyone who wants to see it. What I would like to do is to be able to meld information from the publishers with internal information that we're getting from R&D that happens here, from data repositories that we're in search across all those silos. What my users want is a single interface that gets them everything in a scholarly corpus. And that's what I want to provide, not 500 different interfaces to 500 different products of publishers. And that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. Let me turn it back to Bill. Thank you, Bob. And uh, I want to thank all of our speakers for really giving us some terrific uh, overview presentations and, and raising some extremely important questions that uh, we now will have a chance to explore in greater depth. Uh, so we are right on time. And if you uh, attend as many uh, webinars as I do, you know how rare that is. So congratulations to our speakers. Uh, for uh, for keeping us on schedule and leaving about half an hour for Q and A, um, Allison is going to uh, be in uh, in charge of uh, the process here. And what we thought we'd do, since we have um, a reasonable amount of time left and want this to be as interactive as possible, we uh, we have the capacity to take questions on the phone. We have our uh, operator Debbie standing by, and if you have a question, Debbie, are you with us? I am. 
Terrific. So we have uh, Debbie waiting, and uh, if you have a question, those of you on the phone, uh, I believe all you need to do is press star 1, and that will alert Debbie, and she will then announce the <laughs> question. I get that right, Debbie? That is right. Terrific. So we will be thinking of your questions, and what I'd like to do in the, as we get started here uh, is uh, take a little bit of uh, a co-organizer prerogative. And uh, I wanted to ask um, uh, a question of, um, uh, of Jane uh, about the difference that uh, she is seeing, the difference that scale you're planning might vary across disciplines. Several, several of, the, uh, uh, of our speakers have uh, talked about this a little bit, but I think, we, I think we have a pretty good sense, those of us who have been in the business for a while, that the different disciplines always have a different uh, uh, culture uh, that applies to how uh, the scientist or the professional does his or her work, how uh, they advance in terms of academic recognition, and how they publish. So as, as a large publisher, even though you had talked quite a bit about social science, Janet, you know, you've been, you've been watching how the, how the world works. Are you seeing uh, some of the same core questions and uh, concerns that you raise from the publisher's point of view uh, across the various disciplines you track, or, or uh, are things really widely different depending on, on what the discipline or the specialty is? I think across all disciplines, I think we're certainly seeing a move um, away from print to online. Uh, Bill certainly right there that, that the market is moving. But I think what we're seeing is that there are significant differences in the rate that that, that, that move is taking place. And we publish everything from uh, humanities right the way through to the hard sciences. And we do see significant variations, and I think the further you go towards the humanities, the more likely it is that um, the journals will be um, still primarily read in print. Um, and we also see some of the more practitioner areas, some of the more practitioner areas of medical publishing, um, it is still much, uh, still individual readers um, or members would prefer to, to have a print copy. Um, and, and yet there are other areas where really um, I think the sense we get is that saying at the end that actually um, many of the, um, in some disciplines, I think it's fair to say that if something is not available online and searchable within the library interface, um, or through Google, because um, I think we all have to realize that a lot of uh, users will start with Google, whether they're researchers or students, then you just don't exist. Um, so that's why we're finding that we're having to, to have that balance. And so if a society comes to us and says, shall we move entirely to online only, the first thing we would say is test the optional um, model first to see exactly what your users really want. Um, because it's not always as clear as, well, it's this market, it must be this way. So let me ask Debbie, do we have a question on the line yet, Debbie? We do have one question from the line of Una Schmidt. Hi, this is a question for Robert Schwartzfelder. I'm interested in hearing um, him say that he'd like to see publishers sort of do that compelling case um, with their digital content and really try to maximize the sort of flexibility and exciting adventures of the Internet. And the reason I think I was surprised to hear this is because the comment I hear the most from librarians um, is uh, a concern about archiving and the sort of requirements that publishers really um, create fixed content um, with clear trajectories of versioning um, that can be easily archived, and I just wanted to ask him a little bit more about what he pictures um, between those sort of two tensions. So I think, first of all, Stanford may not be your typical library, and I think we may see this a little bit more in how to capture communities or community input. Some of this is capturing information from the web on versions of websites and other things. Uh, but we've been developing software to really try to engage communities of practice. And 
this type of communication and interaction becomes a really critical issue if you really want to reflect how scholarship is done today. It, it's problematic, it, it's certainly messier uh, than capturing a static image of, of the journal page, uh, but I think it's required that we stay relevant. Uh, if you look at scientific communication, it certainly has changed over the years. Um, letter journals used to be the primary means by which people communicated their thoughts as a community. Uh, certainly that's no longer true. Uh, if we ignore that channel of information, you know, I think as publishers or as libraries, we do it at our own risk. Uh, it's certainly not as clear cut uh, in how to do this, uh, but I think it's important that we engage it or else we risk becoming irrelevant. So it, it is a moving target. I think a lot of the technologies are changing. I think the communities we, we all serve are changing. Um, and I think we have to be aggressive about acknowledging and dealing with that. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, another question on the line, Debbie? We do. We have another question from the line of Rich Dottenhoff. Hi, I had a question for Robert, and um, perhaps it's to go to any librarian who's listening. Um, if a publisher decides to end print, what's the best way to communicate that to your subscribers, and how far? You know, let's differentiate the, the societal subscribers, if it's a societal journal, uh, you know, individual membership uh, and libraries. I do think it's important to communicate that and get feedback. I would also agree with the other speakers that not all communities are ready for that change. Uh, one thing I point to is, is to look at other models by which it's possible. And, and if you look at, at Springer, uh, they're looking at print-on-demand models that would allow the individual to produce a print copy, uh, sometimes at local print stations. So I, I, I think there are alternatives uh, that might lower the cost threshold of being able to provide a print copy without the draconian move of ruling it out entirely. I, I think the important thing is to communicate and work with your community. Actually, we have an extremely small number of individual subscribers, so mm -hmm. that's not a major concern for us. It's mostly the libraries that I'm worried about. And what discipline? Uh, it's uh, biomedical. Okay. You know, I mean, I would, I would certainly communicate this to the universities. And biomedical, I, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of opposition. Okay, but what's the best way to get that message out there? I mean, I've been told that direct mail doesn't work. Um, nobody's looking at the print copy, so don't put it in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I think well, one of the problems I think publishers often have is the people you're communicating with are the, the technical services people who actually receive the items and, and pay the bills. Uh, the folks you want to communicate with are the subject librarians uh, in the disciplines who actually are making the collection. Some societal publishers, for instance, who have done a good job with this. Uh, American Chemical Society, who I've worked with for a number of years, uh, really engages that library community and has, you know, regular communication channels with them. It's required a little bit of work to do this. Uh, I think if there is an agent, though, that you're working with in the library, sending a communication to them and asking them to get in touch with the selector or bibliographer for the area uh, with a message would probably be the easiest and quickest thing to do. Okay, thanks. There are no further audio questions. Okay, uh, uh, I, Allison, that tells me we have a question coming in on the uh, chat line, but before we go to that, since uh, we've been talking about societal issues, uh, I thought maybe, uh, Bill Cook, you might want to just uh, chat briefly about how someone uh, in a, uh, at a society thinks about sort of the, the value proposition questions, the cultural questions, the member relation questions, 
of getting uh, out of print or moving that way or providing a range of options for members because I think as either you or someone else said, and I've, I've, I've heard this from others, uh, the society uh, really is bound to many of its members through traditional print publications. Many, many society members uh, uh, see the tangible benefit of membership, if you will, as the journal or the newsletter or the magazine. So since that just came up in the last exchange, which I think was fascinating, do you want to just chat a little bit from your inside perch about how you think about those questions? Um, I, 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 and this is strictly uh, the AGU perspective. Um, I have worked at uh, another large publisher, and I know what they've done. Um, and what that says to me, uh, we don't have at AGU a whole lot of individual uh, print subscriptions. We still have some. Um, we have a fairly significant number of electronic subscriptions, but in fact, both of the versions of uh, individual subscriptions are in decline. And that, there, there was a crossing point uh, that happened at, uh, probably a couple of years ago. And the way I've analyzed it is to say as the coverage of the society's journals becomes fairly complete within the academic marketplace and in our case within the government marketplace, the individuals give up their subscriptions. They don't give up their memberships, but they give up their subscriptions because there's no reason for them to continue to pay a, uh, for a subscription out of their own pocket when they can sit down at their terminal, log into their um, uh, library, and read the articles that they need, whether they get the, read them online or print them out and take them home and read them at home, it doesn't make any difference, but they're available from their library. So they really don't need the individual subscription anymore. And what we offer that is actually beginning to get some take up, and it's from either retirees or from uh, people that are uh, working uh, kind of in peripheral parts of uh, our area of coverage is uh, uh, article packages. So 20, 40, 60, 100 articles, uh, each of them carrying uh, a discounted price. And then, you know, the, the member can look at anything they want. Society is going to have to assess that for themselves. I'll be surprised if uh, there aren't societies uh, out there who are seeing their member uh, subscriptions fall fairly significantly. And I think that's going to, that trend is going to continue. I think those will actually uh, uh, decline to zero before the institutional uh, subscriptions do. May I pick up on a point that was just made? Sure. This is, yeah, I think this ability to be able to repackage information in a tailored way is really an opportunity that a number of publishers are missing. Uh, there are some publishers, for instance, IEEE is a societal publisher, uh, has embedded across a lot of different articles uh, a lot of material and intelligent vehicle highway systems. If this is a community of interest, if you could package that as, a, as in a sense, a derivative journal or a derivative collection of content, you would have a marketplace where now you don't because the material is so scattered across so many journals that you're not reaching that population. So I think flexibility in terms of repackaging, specializing, and creating kind of a, a niche marketplace uh, is really a, an extra revenue stream that a lot of publishers are now passing up. So we do have um, a question on, and it's from the chat box that I thought I would bring up. It's from Judy Luther, and it's from Bill Cook. She was wondering what feedback you have received from users on the readability of two user communities out there. Um, we actually uh, tried the 
reading version, the member version, first with the library community. And there were some real concerns with finding uh, and how they would be able to use that for uh, an archive. And the reality is you really can't bind it very well uh, so that it keeps the same um, uh, orientation uh, as the older journals were. So that's why we went to the two versions, the archive copy and the reading copy. Um, the reality is also that the condensed and rotate uses a whole lot of white space that we had in the previous versions that was serving no useful purpose. So we're not down to 50% of a page size, and it's more like 70%. They are readable. Um, we've had a couple of complaints that, you know, it's too small to read. Um, okay, you know, sorry to hear that, but um, we can't continue to produce uh, print journals in the same formats with the same cost that we have before. Uh, you know, we're, we're not going to go back to the old version, the old format. It, it just is cost prohibitive. And when we explain that to people, you know, they probably still grumble a little bit, but, you know, then they make their choices. Just a reminder that we do, as uh, Allison just said, I push, we do have the chat function working along with the, uh, the phone uh, function. So if you have a question, you can use the chat box or you can uh, press star 1 to alert our operator, Debbie, and let her know that uh, you have a question. Any other questions on the line, Debbie? At this time, there are no questions. Uh, curious, Jane, and, and this came up, uh, it, I was thinking of... Uh, of uh, Bill's uh, notations and let the market decide. And we've, we've talked about that for a long time. As a publisher, that obviously is something you understand quite well, as, as others do. But I do wonder, remembering back to the early days of web publishing, where we always said, if you wait until the market is ready, you've waited too long. So I wonder how you, as a publisher with a very big business, balance these questions of leading versus following the market, and how do you make a strategic decision about how, how and where to invest in order to be ready so that when the market says, okay, time is right, uh, you can chin up quickly, because we know that in SPM publishing, it's very hard to turn the battleship. Some, some folks have been trying to turn it for 10 or 15 years. So how do you address that from the, the publisher's perspective? I think that's a really interesting question, and it, it's one that, that I think any publisher, big or small, grapples with all the time is, is um, how, how fast is too fast and how far is too far. Um, one of the things that, that we do actively and, and, and vigorously is really connect with uh, the marketplace, connect with our users, with uh, librarians, with advertisers, with societies. Um, what is it that they want to see now and in the future? Um, but in the end, I don't think there's any um, uh, any better way than, than small-scale experimentation, which is what we've been doing um, in, in a number of different areas. So the, the two that I mentioned, the uh, move of some of our journals to online only and the uh, printing of uh, books and non-printing of, of our book series last year. These are experiments, and they're experiments from time to time to see uh, just how far the market wants to move. Um, I think uh, changing, say, for example, our wholesale business model would be an experiment too far at this moment. Um, but I think being able to try out different, different opportunities when we can um, I think it's the way to find out whether or not what the market says they want is what they really want. Um, because I'm sure that, that um, many, many um, publishers are hearing from all over, uh, give us the lowest cost you possibly can from the librarians because obviously budgets are very tight. And moving to online only is a way of really stripping some costs out of the, the whole business. But at any time, you have to have uh, at least a first print copy cost, even print on demand, there is still a cost there, um, and it, adding uh, extra versions, different types of printing, smaller number of pages, all of these things, moving 
more content online. I think all publishers are trying to find ways to reduce costs. Um, having said that, the number of articles that are demanding to be published by the academic community just needs to go on up and up. So it's, it's, it's a tough market, and I think it is tough to, to know exactly when is the right time to make a wholesale move. Yeah, I think we've got a, a good follow-up question to that on, on the chat from which Todd and Hop. He's wondering if the move to online only might be more palatable if the journal is also offering a mobile device version. That, well, that's, that's a very interesting question. And again, it's something that uh, the feedback we're getting from librarians at the moment uh, from the research that we're doing is that in terms of actual app downloads, um, I think everybody's doing it. But again, I'm not sure how many people are actually using those. Um, as a replacement for uh, the print copy. But I think time will tell. Maybe that will be the answer. Uh, but in the end, how many students and how many faculty will have an iPad if you want to do any kind of serious reading? Great. We do have another chat question, which is sort of um, changing direction slightly. I think maybe, um, Bob, this might be a good question for you. It's from Barry Simic. He is saying that, there, that he's seen a trend in which many of their students and these are college students are not buying textbooks because of the cost. Mm -hmm. So he's curious if there are any developments with respect to academic libraries supplying the textbook needs of a campus by means of e-textbooks or, or chapters or parts of textbooks. Well, you know, okay, let, so let's start off by, by speaking very plainly here. Uh, textbooks really can be a cash cow for publishers, and the trend is, at least for popular ones, uh, for with large audiences to to redo them every couple of years, change the problem sets if they're a sci tech textbook. They are costly. Uh, often the, the changes from edition to edition are, are fairly small. Uh, students have gotten pretty savvy about this. Uh, libraries are, uh, I don't think, in, in a very good position to to assist them. Often, getting electronic textbooks, it, it's very limited. It's very problematic uh, contractually. They're just not as available. You know what I've observed the students doing is coming up with very clever ways of copying the problem sets. So they're savvy to the fact that often the changes are minor. Uh, and they're working around that. Uh, but there's a lot of avoidance behavior in terms of buying those because the textbooks have gotten very, very high, particularly in the STEM area. Uh, but libraries have not contractually been able to do a tremendous amount here. I, I do think there must be some way of, of creating a cost model that would make sense with textbooks so we can. I would frankly love to be able to embed textbooks in our course management system. I think this would make a lot of sense for people. But I do understand some for some publishers, this is how they make their money, and it carries the cost of other things from which there's very little profit. Not a great answer, but it's what I have. What about, uh, just a follow-up question from Rebecca Sacha, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that on chat. She is saying, well, what about e-textbook rentals? Well, you know, there, I've seen some experiments in there, but it's hardly mainstream. Um, and in, in terms of reaching the vast number of textbooks and the vast number of students, you know, there, there are some experiments out there, but again, there's too much money to be made in producing textbooks where there's a large number of classes. It, you know, if you have an intro to biology class, what publisher is really going to do an, an e-textbook rental? It's a huge market, uh, it's very lucrative, and it will support a lot of risk that you're taking as a book publisher, which is a scary business, uh, there's as well. I mean, I, 
I know people have made quite a bit of money in writing textbooks. Uh, it's, it's really not something where if you approach them and say, how about doing an open source one, you know, when you can basically buy a car from the next textbook that you write, uh, you know, it's a hard argument to make. Okay, another question from Bill Cook on the chat from Irving Rockwood. Um, he, is, he, he says, you've indicated you now send your individual print copies directly to individuals overseas. Rather than drop shipping to the agent's address, my question is, how and from whom did you obtain the individual's addresses? No, sorry. I'm, I, 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 if that's the understanding, I misspoke then. Um, we charge the delivery fee uh, for overseas delivery, even if we ship to a drop ship address. Um, and we tell the agent, look, we're sending this to you. As soon as you take delivery of it, it becomes your responsibility. If you lose it, that's your responsibility, not ours. We will replace the issue if we go back up on press and we'll charge you a uh, single issue price for it. We do require our agents, our drop show, we do require that agents provide us uh, final addresses uh, for uh, whether they're a drop ship agent or whether they're simply a buying agent. We think we get most of them. We don't know that they are, in fact, always the correct uh, final address, which just introduces more trouble into the, into the system. But in the case where the customer has told us to, to uh, send the, the copy to the drug, Let me ask Debbie if we have any other uh, calls on the line. I want to be sure we get everybody in before we end in about five minutes. At this time, we do not have any audio questions. Okay. Allison, anything else on chat? Nothing um, else. Anything else on chat yet, so. Okay, then I have, uh, I have one, uh, what may be the last uh, question uh, for Bob. Uh, as someone who has had conversations with a number of publishers, and, and you raised this yourself, about uh, what sorts of new products might be of particular value uh, to the institutional market. Uh, you mentioned that some of the uh, multimedia technologies really are not quite ready for prime time, but certainly in some of these specialties and disciplines, I, I think of uh, medicine and uh, biomedical research, uh, showing rather than telling seems to have a, a significant amount of potential value anyway in the professional context. I'm just wondering, as, as uh, someone who is at Stanford who is helping to build uh, a, a large and enrolled digital library and has thought about this, uh, are you hearing from publishers with some of these new multimedia products that begin to rise to the level of presenting enough of a use case or a business case that you're, you're ready to hear their pitch and perhaps uh, bring them on uh, as part of your budget? Well, um you know, we we did add Scopus about, I guess, about a year ago, and, and I think that was based on functionality. In terms of a mainstream product, uh, that's one I point to. Uh, we've had several pitches from people who are looking at providing derivative content in terms of, of identifying specialists. So they look at citation or co-citation patterns and basically identify if they've been pretty well worn. People have been for a number of years uh, developing products to identify specialists. And, and the problem is that generally, perhaps it's hubris, perhaps it's true, uh, the people at Stanford assume they know who the major people are. So it, it's really hard to get a lot of user uptick with that kind of product. Um, we, we have been looking at you know, we, we deal in, in, in small experimental spaces, uh, so we work with a company called Terribly Clever uh, to develop uh, uh, web applications for the iPhone. Uh, they were bought out by Blackboard, I think, about a year, year and a quarter ago, and so we had started working with them. Um, 
we, from publishers, I would say, a lot of the conversations are like these, where people are really looking at mainstream publications and wondering how far to go e. Uh, we're not getting a lot of, of, I'd say, interesting new product space. Uh, we're seeing more of that from technology companies, to be really honest with you. Um, the, the Google approach with the Google Books, and, and I talked about Judge Chin's decision, uh, you know, we're really excited about some of the directions that they wanted to take uh, because we thought embodied in that was the opportunity to be able to do search and pattern analysis with a large body of material. So there are a lot of, of humanities professors we're working with who do semantic analysis for whom having a very large body of digital information would be very interesting. Uh, we're doing some work in the RDF triple space to search against different sorts of information, which is interesting, and we have an open source community on that. On the publisher side, not as much. Terrific. Well, I'm uh, going to take that as our uh, opportunity to thank our uh, speakers, uh, Jay Marks from SAGE, uh, Bill Cook from the AGU, American Geophysical Union, and Bob Schwarzwalder from Stanford. Uh, I'll also thank my, uh, my co-organizer, Allison Mauer from uh, the University of Utah Marion Library. And thanks to all of you who have been on the line. I thought the uh, discussions were really good, excellent questions. And I have a feeling that this is one of those topics that, uh, whether it's uh, in a webinar format or at any of the SST uh, sessions that will be coming up uh, later this year or in the future, uh, we are not done with talking about uh, so you want to get out of print. So thank you very, very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next SST webinar. Thank you. That concludes today's teleconference. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold.